It's the Emma Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. Welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Before we begin, I would like to thank you all for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. This episode is brought to you by BookBannersEtc.com and Willow Kestel Jewelry. If you enjoy the show and would like to become a sponsor, you can by contacting me directly at emmett.blackwell at gmail.com. On this episode, I have author and poet Ann Rasco Joyce. She has battled bullying and has transcended that into her poetry. She recently regained a passion for writing, and in doing so, wrote a novella named When the Chips Are Down. Her most recent book, Arid, is a story that hinges on sci-fi with a touch of reality. We are very excited to have Anne Rasco Joyce, so without any further ado, let's begin. It's a distant future, and the country is overtaken by wealthy moguls who dominate the water supply and sell it back to the public at ridiculous prices. After a drastic crime increase, engines who can't afford water are stripped of their belongings and forced out of town by an army of brutes called the Purifiers. Life becomes harsh and ominous for the bright, ambitious Josh Wyman and his group until they begin to occasionally receive food and other basic amenities from the brutes. When the blatant abuse of Purifier power during a routine visit leaves them reeling, Joshua and his friends reach their breaking point. They devise a plan to steal the Purifier's vehicle during their next visit and find a place where water is affordable. Their journey across the uncharted wastelands filled with murderers and thieves proves to be far more than this civilized benevolent crew bargained for. Growing tensions within the nearby towns may cause the two worlds to collide, creating an epic storm. Get your copy of Arid by Ann Joyce at Amazon.com today. And I have the author here, Ann Rasco Joyce. Hello, Ann. How are you today? All right, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. So now, you've written for some time. You started writing poetry at the age of 13, and you received an honorable mention for literary excellence for your poem, She Didn't Come Home. What helped inspire that poem? Um, Well, actually, what inspired that poem and me writing poetry is because um, when I was in grade school and middle school, I was bullied, and I was bullied bad. Um, And I... Not only at school, but I didn't even get to go home and get away from it. I I lived near the bullies, so I was constantly surrounded by it. So I thought about running away a lot, you know, just to be away from my situation. So I think that's largely what inspired She Didn't Come Home. Wow. That's, That's an issue that still exists today for kids, you know, being bullied and things like that. So. That's that's a good thing that you were able to write it out. Not most kids can. So, um, would you care to share a portion of that poem with us now? Sure. She didn't take her car. She said she'd walk instead. She needed to leave the house. She needed to clear her head. She didn't take a friend. She left the house alone. We waited up all night, but she did not come home. Wow, that's that's very touching. You know, it's simple and touching, and it really kind of gets down to the point of what's going on, you know. So, I mean, during this this whole event, I mean, the fact that you started writing this, did you ever run away from home and stay away from home for a time? Or No, I, honestly, I had nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. And I live in southern Indiana. It gets really cold in the winter, and... Plus, I had my animals. I didn't want to leave my cats and my dogs behind. So, honestly, that's probably why the main reason why I didn't. Wow, that's that's got to be hard, too. You know, but then again, you know, just like with writing, your mind can go anywhere. You know, it's really incredible. <laughs> so, now, you attended business school, and you were very successful. You made the dean's list three years in a row. How has your business background helped you with your writing path? Um, I wouldn't say my business background has helped me that much. I mean, I, uh, you know, of course I had to take a lot of English and literature classes when I was in college, you know, it was just kind of the core, the prerequisites for just about anything. So I'd say that would help me, you know, just kind of build my language skills and things, but yeah, not business specifically, not so much. 
Hmm. Yeah, definitely. So now you're in your mid-20s and you just started writing again. Um, what helped bring back that passion for writing? Actually, it was a political post. It was a post I was on MySpace at the time, and it was just kind of like a conspiracy post. It wasn't, you know, for one side or the other or anything like that. It was just um, how the government plans to use microchips, you know, or how what this post theorized, what they were going to do with the microchips. And, you know, of course, none of it was good. So Mm -hmm. I just kind of took that and let my mind go wild. And that's kind of when the chips were down, came out. So so basically you kind of fell into the sci-fi world of it all, correct? Right. Yeah. And actually, you know, I mean, I remember... MySpace. I remember um, going on there and uh, reading posts sim- probably similar to yours. And really, it gets the creative juices flowing when you watch the news a little bit and you say, hmm, it's that's, that's kind of crazy. It's like in a sci-fi dystopian world. Um, it's just unbelievable to me that uh, people can pull inspiration from uh, news articles and things like that. Oh, yeah. It's great to have. You know, I just kind of take the vents around me and draw on them and just imagine how further down the hole it could go, you know, whenever I see something start to go in such a negative way. And I mean, there's so much now. I mean, we're in a dystopia, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely. Um, And actually, you know what, we're going to talk a little bit more about your books here after a message from our sponsors. Have you ever found yourself looking for a gift, but just can't find something that's unique and different? There are many online shops to find jewelry, but most of those sites carry manufactured creations that are mass-produced. The internet is at your fingertips. You shouldn't have to travel through all the realms to get something amazing. At Willow Kestrel Jewelry, you will find handcrafted creations. Whether you are looking for wire-wrapped pendant, natural shells, or beautiful precious gemstones, you will find it all at Willow Kestrel Jewelry Shop at Etsy.com. Willow Kessel Jewelry uses genuine gemstones, including amethyst, moonstone, citrine, rose quartz, laramar, malachite, sapphire, and many more. You can make it rain with gemstones. I know I did. And it felt like I had been transported back in time to when me and my friend had to take a ring back to a mountainous volcano and toss it in to save the world. Now you can use the coupon code BLACKWELL20. That's Blackwell with the number 20 to save 20% at checkout. Search Willow Kessel Jewelry under shops at etsy.com today. In a world full of obstacles and haphazard graphics, one company has broken the mold of building amazing book covers, banners, video trailers, and more. Book Banners Etc. is your premier source for the most epic designs. Constructed from the mind of independent author Lynn Lamb, Book Banners Etc. is dedicated to making your dream a reality. They offer an array of marketing materials at affordable prices. If you're looking for book covers that pop, Banners that captivate, swag for signing, and alluring video trailers stop by www.bookbannersetc.com. That's bookbannersetc.com. Imagine your world, then make it epic with www.bookbannersetc.com. All right, and we're back. Now, your most recent book, Arid, focuses on a dystopian world where water is scarce. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the premise of that story. Right, um... Well, what actually happens is the country becomes overtaken by wealthy moguls. They buy up the water supply and dominate dominate that, and they sell it back to the public at ridiculous prices. And they just keep raising water prices, imposing tariffs. So it comes to the point where only the wealthiest people can even afford water and to pay their bills and feed their families. And crime within the city gets so bad that eventually everyone who can't afford water is labeled indigents and they're exiled. And that's where my main character, Josh, and his group are at the beginning. They're out in the desert wastelands scraping by just trying to survive. They're in a dwindling group of, you know, what was 25 and then there's only eight of them. And they're... There's a militant force called the purifiers that basically try to act as a police force and instill order. And then they realize that Josh is actually useful because he knows about wind turbines and there aren't a lot of people left to do. So they occasionally bring him supplies and basic amenities. But the purifiers are very corrupt 
and they do something quite terrible that inspires Josh to do something very drastic to try to change their situation. Wow. It's a really cool premise because, I mean, really, you think about it, it's not too far off from reality. It wasn't um, too long ago, and I'm not sure if it's still going on because I don't keep up too much with current events, but um, here in the state of Michigan, we had a whole bunch of bottle water companies come in, and they were basically draining our lakes, our Great Lakes, and then basically selling it back to the people. And uh, there's a there's a big hoopla about it, um, and, and it kind of fell into that same concept of your story. And honestly, like when I started looking into your book, I was it, it was something that really drew me to it. Because of the fact that water is, is, you know, that life-giving source. And, you know, when you sell it back to the people, it's like, why? You know, this stuff falls from the sky, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so now you have other characters along with Joshua in this. Um, what types of characters make up the group that he has? Um, there's Maria. Maria's she's a little, she's a good combination of, you know, she has a child, so she's, you know, that protective mom, but she's also, you know, a strong woman. She's a powerful woman, you know, knows how to fight good with weapons, that type of thing. Um, there's Blaine and Skylar. They're a younger couple and they're very helpful. They're a good supporting pair. And Zia Mara, she's kind of like, she's the sensitive one. She's the caretaker. Um, and then there's Julio Julio's, he's kind of rough around the edges. Cause I mean, well, they've all had hard lives, but kind of, especially him when he's, he has the best survival skills. He's the most adept and taught them a lot about how to take care of themselves and live out in that environment. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you really do have a slice of just about everything and it's multidimensional because of the fact that, like you said, you have the mother and the child and, and you have this couple and I mean, you really have done a, a good job of pulling different people in and, and that's an excellent way of getting your reader to, to relate to the story. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> so now, um, what do you have planned for the future of your writing? Do you plan to continue the book into a series or something? It's very possible. I did kind of leave that open to happen. So I haven't decided 100% sure, but I very, may very well write a sequel to Arid. Hmm. So we'll see. Right, possibly. So now you've also written a novella under the name Anne Rasco. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. That one was actually um, inspired by that political post I saw on MySpace about the microchips and the conspiracy theories about what the government was going to do with those. Um, in my story, it becomes mandatory for everyone to wear a microchip. Um, and they, you know, the government leader said it would cut down on terrorism and it would protect against theft because you use your microchip to make purchases and things with, so no one could just, you know, steal your wallet. Um, but what they didn't tell people, it was actually a form of mind control. Hmm. That's interesting. I like that. So now, um, so with this whole microchip thing, I mean, what are the downfalls of, of taking this chip other than the mind control? Well, it's also has a homing device so they can find you anytime they want. Wow. You're, you're, yeah, you're virtual GPS all the time. And I think, don't they do that with cattle nowadays? Like, <laughs> it's like they uh, tag animals with uh, chips, and so now you can find them. Um, yeah, and you know what? The, the scariest part is, is, like I said before, it's not that far off. I mean, you've probably heard the stories in the media already about people who can get into office buildings. Their company asks them to get a chip. Um, it's scary. You know, it really is. Oh, yeah. I've seen interviews where there are some people that have voluntarily had the chip put in their arm. And, yeah, I think there's probably certain sectors of government employees that are required to. Yeah, yeah it, that's not something I'd consent to. Yeah, and, you know, it's like <clears throat> with uh, cell phones and things like that nowadays that we already have. I mean, honestly, the government might be listening to this podcast right now. But <laughs> I'm not sure if they are. But um, anyhow, I haven't gotten any calls. 
Um, but <laughs> um, it's, there's just a there's just a van parked outside. That's okay. Uh, the, he comes by every day, and along with his other van buddies, uh, it, <laughs> it's like Men in Black. Okay, but um, anyhow, so now what do, what else do you have coming up next? What what's the future for Anne? Right now, I am actually working on a sequel to Arid. It's called Parched. Um, it goes into more detail about what happened to the characters or what happened to Josh, Maria and Paula before, you know, I mean, when Arid starts, they're already in the desert, in the wilderness. It's a, it's a short story and it describes more in detail of how they got there Wow, cool. and what struggles they went through. Definitely neat. It's, it is very cool because it does carry on the story. So now what advice would you give a new author who's just getting started? If they're just starting out, um, as far as writing, I would tell them to purchase a book on Amazon called Techniques of the Selling Writer. Uh, it's by Swain, his last name, S-W-A-I-N. I learned a lot from that. Um, I would say go to as many seminars as you can. Um, when it comes time to market your book, uh, attend as many webinars, seminars as you can. Um and also network with other authors because mm. you need the support. You need to scratch each other's backs. Yeah, definitely. It's something that, you know, we here on the uh, Emmett Blackwell show definitely pride ourselves on is, is getting independent author voices out there. So I do appreciate you being on the show. Where can people find your book? It is available on Amazon.com in digital and print. Awesome. Awesome. Check out Arid, everybody. It It's so close to reality that you're going to hopefully be reading that thing thinking, man, this could be the next week's paper. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so anyhow, um, now we've hit the segment of the show where we actually are going to put you through a quiz, but we're going to do something different, okay? We're going to do a, a little bit of a, a word conversation game and uh, this one's called two truths one lie okay so <laughs> <laughs> this one might be fun i've never tried this one all right so here's how it works um what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to come up with two truths and one lie and then i'm gonna have to guess which one was the lie and um then you're gonna do one for me and then we're gonna see uh let's do like best two out of three all right and uh whoever okay. gets the most points wins a billion trillion points all right Okay. All right. So I'll go first. Okay. My first truth is, um, gosh. Okay. So when I was younger, I owned a boat. That's my first. My second thing is, uh, when I was younger, I also owned an elephant. And the last thing is when I was younger, I owned a Ghostbusters Ecto-1 car toy. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say the elephant's a lie. <laughs> yes, it is. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I wish I had an elephant, but I never got one. But I loved my Ecto-1. It was so cool. And my boat was really just a leaky boat. So <laughs> it didn't really go anywhere. It was more like a uh, sinking stone. So, all right. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, my first truth, my eyes are two different colors. Second truth, um, I've collectively, collectively over my life had about 50 animals, dogs, cats, rabbits, birds, whatever. Um, my third truth, I can drive a five speed. Hmm. Oh man, this is hard. Um, okay. Uh, the lie is you have two different color eyes. Ah, uh, you got me. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. I never win at games. So, <laughs> all right. So here we go. Here's uh, the next one. Um, so we each got a point. Um, all right. Uh, one thing about me is that I am 600 years old. Uh, another thing is uh, um, I drive a stick shift. And the last thing is when I was younger... I had a crush on a girl, and one time I asked her to dance, but she just said no, and so I went off to the bleachers and cried. And, <laughs> and really, that could that could be a whole nother segment of like you know truths from Emmett Blackwell, but we're not going to do that. So anyhow, uh, which one is the lie? 
Um, unless you're a vampire, I'm gonna say you're not 600 years old. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not. <laughs> uh, yep, you win that one. All right. So, um, is you get one more try at this. Hopefully, we don't uh, tie here. And if we do, then we might have to just take ties. All right. Okay. Uh, my first truth. I've been going gray since I was 15. Uh, my second truth. I love coleslaw. It's my favorite food in the world. Third truth, uh, my doctor told me I was going to go blind when I was 10. Oh, whoa. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's a lot There's a lot riding on this one. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that the lie is, uh, huh. The lie is that you were going gray since you were 15? Nope. I hate coleslaw. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, you won this one. Um, And so uh, congratulations. Um, I guess, I I don't know, maybe I should award you like 12 billion points. Um, The the points really don't go anywhere. You can't use them for currency or anything, but, you know, you can say you have them. So um, I want to thank you so much for being here on the show. Uh, It was an amazing experience. It was. Thank you so much for having me. It was good talking to you. All right. And everybody out there, check out Arid. Um, and this is underneath, uh, it's not under Ann Rasco, is it? Uh, it's under Ann Joyce, actually. J O Y C E. All right. So everybody, check out Arid by Ann Joyce on Amazon.com. And uh, thank you so much again for being on the show. It was great. Thanks. You too. All right. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. It's the Emma Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world.